Our first speaker is Maggie Benneke, and the title of her talk is, What Do We Say to the Children? Think back to your earliest experiences in school. Did you learn about this civil rights activist? This is Fannie Lou Hamer, a woman with a disability who worked tirelessly to ensure that folks in Mississippi registered to vote in the, in the face of racial discrimination. Or maybe did you learn about Johnny Lacey, a woman of color, a wheelchair user, and a leader in the independent living movement? Or perhaps you learned about Jazzy Collins, a black tra transgender activist who advocated for the rights of seniors, folks with disabilities, and people in the LGBTQIA community. As you think back about your earliest experiences in school, whose stories were told and whose were left out? For me and many of my research participants, classroom materials and practices often centered white, able-bodied subjects. And unless it was Black History Month or we were reading stories about Helen Keller, both of which op often positioned ableism and racism as individual attitudes of people in the past, conversations about disability and race were often silenced in our educations. And such silencing centered my identities and it taught me to evade conversations that challenged the status quo. But as an early childhood teacher, I soon learned that young children were talking about identity and fairness all the time, asking me questions and making comments that I wasn't prepared for. For instance, here are some comments and questions I've heard from young children. One child pointing to a little child with Down syndrome. That boy is a baby. I don't want to play with him. A child of color to me. When I grow up, I want skin like you. And even, why did they shoot Charlena, a black disabled woman here in Seattle? As a novice teacher, comments and questions like these stop me in my tracks. What do we say to the children? Research shows that as early as age three, young children are building complex ideas about identity, demonstrating prejudicial attitudes and discriminatory behaviors toward individuals whose identities differ from their own. But prejudice and discrimination are social processes. Children are learning these identities and behaviors through implicit messages in our inequitable system. And they're learning through our silence. And here's the deal. As a new teacher, as a white, able-bodied woman, there were times when I avoided the conversation, feeling unsure of how to respond. I was complicit in my silence. But I had critical colleagues who helped me process my position, asking questions of myself and my practice in this imperfect world. Why do I feel this way? What do I need to unlearn? What don't I know and why don't I know it? How was I socialized into an oppressive system? And how can I center critical counter-narratives in my classroom? By approaching my practice with humility, by falling flat, sitting with it, and trying again, by seeing how young children approached conversations about identity and fairness with passion, savvy, and creativity, I learned to lean in. Our early childhood teachers are navigating young children's questions and comments at a time when preschoolers of color are disproportionately suspended and expelled from schools. Preschoolers. When preschoolers with disabilities are learning in often very segregated environments. When youth of color with disabilities are at an increased risk for incarceration and police violence and when hateful language and images related to both disability and race have increased during and following the 2016 US presidential election. Young children are asking, comments, are asking questions and making comments about identity and fairness at a time when strong messages about disability and race are most certainly circulating in their worlds. Yet, the majority of early childhood teachers who are white and able-bodied are often not taught to explicitly talk about disability and race. In my work, I'm examining the tools and processes that so can support teachers to navigate these conversations, to listen to children, and to ask questions alongside them. How can we make the world a more fair place for people like Charlena Lyles? And what can we learn from stories of people like Fannie Lou Hamer? 
I've invited teachers to map their identities and educational histories. And together we've used these maps as a tool to examine their current practice and to plan for future instruction. This process has allowed teachers to begin to see the importance of talking about disability and race in their classrooms. As one teacher said, I'm starting to ask myself, what do children think about this and why? It's mobilized teachers to increase participation for young children into these conversations, and it's allowed them to envision future possibilities for their teaching. In this work, teachers continue to ask, what do we say to the children? And it's my hope that when they ask this question, instead of silencing the conversation, instead of retreating, they're sitting with the discomfort as they lean in, acknowledging young children's capacity to engage and, approach, and approaching the conversation in an ongoing journey toward educational justice. And it's also my hope that when young children ask questions about disability and race, about identity and fairness, that teachers begin the conversation some, in some way like this. You know what? Our differences make us strong and brilliant. Things are unfair, and they've been unfair, and unfairness hurts. I don't have all the answers, but I'm committed to working on this together with you. Thank you.